When I told people that I was going to be interviewing Gail Collins, almost every person I said this to said, oh, she's so much fun. <laughs> so Gail Collins is known as the fun columnist at the New York Times, <laughs> the one that you'd actually like to have a beer with, the one who seems, as someone said to me, normal. <laughs> um, but Gail really isn't normal. The truth is, she comes across as normal, but anyone as productive as she is, is not normal in the way you and I are. Um, she has just written a new book, in addition to writing a column twice a week for the New York Times. She was the first female editor of the New York Times editorial pages. There are a million other things I could tell you about her, but the bottom line is not normal. <laughs> Gail, come on up here, this is your fan base. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? I, I'm worried about these microphones. Do they, are they working? Yeah. They're not working. Microphones not working. A person who knows about microphones? Anyone? Is that? This may never, we may be in, how's that one work? No. I wonder if I took one of yours. Am I, is that, oh, it's here. We've got oh, it. Yay. Okay. Yay. Whoever did that, thank you so much. That was, you've saved our day. Can I just thank all you guys for having me here today. It is so seldom I get to come to Chicago. I love Chicago so much. And you know, it's like when you're covering elections, I'm always in Florida or Iowa or something. You never get to come to Chicago. And I, it's just a real treat to be here. So thank you so much. So Gail, before we get to the hard stuff, I, I want to ask you a question. Are you as fun as everyone thinks? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my husband has lived under this burden for a long time. He said people are always coming up to him in the store and saying, wow, it must be a laugh a minute at your house. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he says, well, you know, she's not always <laughs> that entertaining. You know? <laughs> so no, no. So let, let, let's talk about something more serious, which is Gail's new book, which is a very entertaining but serious read. As Texas goes, dot, dot, dot. The subhead is How the Lone Star State Hijacked the American Agenda. Gail, talk to us a little bit about the premise of this book. This all sort of started, I don't, you probably remember the Rick Perry secession moment when he gave the secession speech, which was not, he did not really call for secession. He just violently lambasted the federal government in front of a large crowd carrying signs that said secede, but that was... <laughs> And you know, afterwards he said something like, no, 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 we've got a fine union, there's no talk of leaving, although you know if Washington continues to do the terrible things it's doing, who knows what will happen, which I did not regard as a real commitment. I mean, it was like if you're married and your spouse says, there's nothing wrong with this marriage, there's no reason to dissolve it, but if you continue to behave in this unsatisfactory manner, who knows what will happen? I mean, it's not, it wasn't good. So I thought about that and I thought about you know, wow, if you look back over the last 30 years, Texas has pretty much dominated the national agenda. If you look back at the savings and loan crisis back in the 80s, that started when Ronald Reagan reorganized the federal SNLs so that their charters resembled the charters of Texas SNLs. And he did that because he felt that um, the Texas ones were so profitable. Now, he had not noticed that the Texas ones were all cooking the books, and that's why they were doing so well. But, and I kind of looked at that, and there was a piece of that story in which the guy from the worst of all, the Vernon Savings and Loan, which the regulator is called Vermin Savings and Loan, went on trial, and his defense against a charge that he had hired a prostitute to entertain one of the, ba the bank regulators was that the bank regulator had not been able to rise to the occasion. And therefore, it was not a bribe in any way, shape, or form. And I, I looked at that and I thought, gosh, you really got to like a state like that. <laughs> I mean, you know? And then I looked at the deregulation of the banks and of all the, the, the financial markets, and there's a 10 trillion people involved in that, obviously, but the really large figure in the, finger in the pie was Senator Phil Graham of Texas, who was head of the banking committee who I had the privilege, I was possibly the only journalist in the world who had the privilege of being on the Phil Graham for President campaign tour in 95, which lasted about as long as this program is going to last. But, and then 
you know, look, no child left behind. Our federal, our federal programs for public schools are organized around the way Texas schools were organized during the George Bush period. Um, energy, the environment, all the land wars and, uh, since Vietnam, uh, it, it, all this stuff comes somehow or another from Texas. And I think we've all underestimated what a huge influence this state is on the rest of the country. One, one of the points that you made that was most intriguing to me and most pertinent to people in Chicago was that the whole charter school movement really got its birth, got nurtured in Texas. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, the fascinating thing about the, te the Texas, what had happened in Texas was a stage thing you might find familiar. Back in the 80s, Texas schools were abysmal, and a reform movement under Ross Perot was organized. And the basis of the movement was, let's get a lot more money for the schools. Let's make the schools smaller. Let's increase teacher pay. Let's really bring Texas into the 20th century. And because Perot was both so crazy and so rich, they managed to get this done. That was a huge reform. A second reform followed for reorganization of the way the schools were funded to reflect the wealth of the communities in which they had to get a new tax, more money poured into the schools. And at that point, the business community said, wait a minute, all this money going in, we want accountability. So there was a combination of more money and more accountability, which basically meant more tests. In Texas, I talked to the people who were involved in that reform period, and their vision was, well, there will be tests, and then the community will get to see the tests, and the parents will get to see the tests, and the teachers will get to see them, so they'll know which kids need help. And if the parents are unhappy with their neighborhood schools, they can do something about it. There was never any thought that there would be large, closed down the school consequences. This didn't come really out of what they thought of as the Texas experience. But the people from the Texas business councils who were working on these programs, many of them went to Washington with George W. Bush. Uh, one of them became the lead negotiator on the No Child Left Behind bill for the White House, and then after that became a lobbyist for Pearson, the world's largest private testing corporation. So, you know, all kind of went together. But about the charter school part of this whole deal, uh, I talked to the people who negotiated the bill in charter schools, nobody ever thought that there was going to be a private sector involvement in the charter school movement. Everybody envisioned some nonprofits would come in and they'd take over a few schools and it would be a good way to innovate and see what happens. Nobody had a vision of, say, internet schooling run by a private corporation who sits, sits an anchor at some obscure school district in the middle of Tennessee and announces that that's a real public school. The amount of private money that's now going into the public school system is to me one of the biggest, hugest consequences of No Child Left Behind and it was something that the people, at least in Congress, who put it together had no thought about. It was just not in their picture at all. And this all comes out of Texas. It all came out of Texas. Yes, it all came out of Texas. Now, when you started this book, how much time had you actually spent in Texas? Before I started the book, I had spent very little time in Texas. I spent quite a bit of, la and this is a very fastly written book as such books go, I spent most of last summer in Texas, which was a really bad career choice. <laughs> 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 Let me plan my life so that I will be in Houston for the month of July. It was just, <laughs> it was completely crazy, but that's what I did. And it's a totally outsider view. I'm not explaining Texas to Texans. I could never do that. I'm talking to the rest of us about what it mean, what Texas means to the rest of the country and what the great cry from Texas of states' rights means to the rest of the country. And talk about the notion of empty spaces, because all of these things that have come out of Texas, you attribute to this, this philosophy of empty spaces that guides life in Texas. Yeah, I liked, I've always liked, since I started looking at Congress long ago to divide the country between the empty spaces people and the crowded spaces people because it makes everything seem more reasonable. Uh, crowded spaces people appreciate government because they can see that government does stuff to help them every day. It 
protects them from burglars. It keeps dogs from pooping on their sidewalk. It stops sewers from exploding. It runs the schools. You, everywhere you go, you, and if most people in crowded places, when they